Amen. Good morning, 10 a.m. Hey, it's Christmas season. You doing okay with that? Hey, just uh, tap somebody next to you and say, hey, it's Christmas time. Just, just tap somebody right next to you and say, hey, it's Christmas time. Up there in the mezzanine, some of you aren't moving. You're just like looking at me. Tap somebody. Say, hey, it's Christmas time. Hey, this is fun. This is an amazing time of year. We get to celebrate. Uh, we get to worship Jesus together. We get to invite friends and family uh, to be with us at, at church services, whether it's our Christmas Eve Eve services or Christmas Eve services. We, we love, 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 love this time of year, and we love you a ton, and uh, are really glad to be together. If you're new here to Real Life, thank you. Man, I'm so excited that God got you in the doors today. I believe that uh, you're at the beginning of something miraculous that God wants to do in your life. And it all starts right now in a place of hunger, anticipation, like desire inside your own heart. You know, you can, you can turn on a switch in your own heart this morning that says, I'm ready to grow. I'm ready to learn. I'm ready to be equipped. I'm ready to hear from God this morning. So is that switch turned on in your heart? You ready to go? Yeah. Let's try it again. Are you ready to go? All right. So let's go. All right. Luke chapter 2. Uh, I, I love the Christmas story. It's, uh, it's a really good time, I think, for us as a church. Uh, Brennan had us do it earlier, just to take a g deep breath as a church and go, wow. Where did this all start? Like, Jesus Church, like, how did we all get here? What, what are we even doing here in this room? Like, what, what brought us to this place and, and, and brought this passion during this worship? Didn't our worship team do an awesome job uh, leading us the last several minutes together? I, I'm so proud of our team around here. I'm so proud of what God is doing in everybody's life. I, I'm just overwhelmed. I, I, I think that uh, God wants to do something really cool today in our hearts. And so uh, I, I want to look at this time, this scripture together, and really believe uh, together that God's going to do something cool. So, you know, I was thinking about, we're going to look at the shepherds here in a moment. And, and, and the shepherds were the ones that got the news first, that the Son of God, the Savior of the world, was coming into this, onto this planet. I was just thinking about, man, how unlikely. Like, why would God choose those guys? Man, if there was somebody not to choose, it was probably those guys. If, if, if you took a, kind of our, our social status and our class system and the way that we kind of categorize people and we go, hey, these people are awesome, these people are not. These people are in, these people are out. If you looked at our judgmental kind of way about us as people, right, always trying to make sure we know where we fit in this life, Jesus, like, like God, he, he walked right through all of that and plucked these shepherds, these guys that were the unlikely ones, the distant ones, the disconnected ones, the ones on the peripheral of society, kind of almost like outcasts, like, like, hey, you like servant guys, you go out there, stay in the field, hang out with the sheep, stink like them, and, and just kind of keep to yourself. We'll do all of the rest of the cool stuff here in town. Man, if God could have chose anybody, which he could have, why would he choose these shepherds? Man, if, if shepherds had, had, had so much stacked against them, society, pressures, culture, and fear. Think about the fear, like if you're a shepherd. Like, man, what God wants them to do is to announce the arrival of his son. Who am I? I'm a, I'm a nobody. I'm on the outside. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of cast into this, this place in our, in our societal ways, in our, in our demographics. I mean, I can't be used by God to do something amazing like announce the arrival of the Savior of the world. And fear does crazy stuff in our hearts. I was thinking about when I was young. I had this arch nemesis all through high school. I hated raccoons. Anybody else hate raccoons? Like... <laughs> I grew up in Seattle. These little demons, they, uh, sorry if you like them, uh, they were like out to get me constantly. I was always sneaking in late, like right before curfew. Can I get an amen on that? And uh, I always made it in, I, I'm pretty sure. But um, man, I would, I would, it was inevitable. These things were always waiting for me in the most unlikely, horrific places. Like right when I creep in the door to open it quietly, they're like right there, you know, like they're going to like growl at me in the dark and all you can see is their eyes, you know, like, so I started like getting smart. I'm going to, we had, I think we had dog food in the garage or something that they like knew the stash. And so they were guarding their stash of dog food that they had kind of hijacked from our, from our dogs. And so, man, I, I started getting smart. I like set brooms out kind of where I parked my car when I got home late at night. I set piles of rocks out. Like I'm ready. If, if I'm going to go to war with these things that terrify me, I am ready. And one night it happened perfectly. Like I had grabbed a rock and I was going to carry it inside with me just in case I encountered one of these little demons. And so I, I literally, I, I got out of my car, I creep around the corner and there he is. He's like, me to Vaughn, me to Jared, like right here. 
And I'm like, I have the rock in my hand. This is it. This is the moment I've been waiting for. I'm going to conquer my fears in this moment, right? And I gave it everything I got. I hit the little demon right in the face. And then, like, the worst thing happened that could have ever happened. All of my fears were confirmed in this moment because it just growled and stared me down. Like, what are you, right? Like, I... I I thought if anything could get rid of this thing, right? These fears that we have in our life, they, they cause us to do crazy things. Like, I was thinking about these shepherds. I was thinking about us. What if, like, what if the fears and the anxieties, the worries in our heart are keeping us from the purpose of God in our lives? What if the, the what ifs are hindering our potential? What if the unknown and the uncertainty of, oh, God has a plan for my life and he wants to do great things through me. That all sounds so awesome, but I kind of can't. I can't because... Richie, you don't understand my past. God, you don't understand how, how broken I am, how, how much pain I've endured, how addicted I was, how, how, how insecure I've always been, how ungifted I am, how, how un, un good at anything I am, right? Like there's all of these anxieties and worries that mount up in our hearts and our heads that seem to trump any kind of um, like logic or understanding. We just find ourselves in these places where we're just ruled by fear. And these shepherds, They came face to face with their fears in this story. And I'm I'm blown away by what happened as they did. I want you to look at Luke chapter 2 with me. Start in verse 8. It says, that night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby. Luke chapter 2 verse 8. There were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, nearby Bethlehem. They were guarding their flocks of sheep. That's what shepherds do. And suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them. And the radiance, listen to this phrase, the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. Just just imagine for a moment, the God of the universe, his glory, like the radiance, the the light, the, the brightness of his glory shone completely around them. I, I just I want you to kind of consider for a second if you have any recollection of Scripture at all, go back into the Old Testaments, go back to some of the prophets, go back to the Moses and the, the Abrahams and the, the Isaacs and the Jacobs, and I want you to consider every time one of these prophets, one of these leaders of God's people encountered the presence of God, the living God, the creator of the universe, any time they encountered him, they found themselves flat on their face, Amen. overwhelmed Amen. by his presence. The shepherds. And if they had anything to be afraid of before, now they definitely got something to be afraid of. They were terrified, the Bible says. But the angel, I love this, the angel of God reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all the people. The presence of God is terrifying, overwhelming, and exciting all at the same time. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you, you shepherds, you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, now, like, if that wasn't terrifying enough, listen to this. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, other angels, the armies of heaven, surrounded Man, if there's, if there's like something to kind of shrink your perspective about all the fears and insecurities that you walked into a moment with, it would be this, right? If you're ever kind of like looking for something to minimize all the fears and concerns and worries of this life, the presence of God seems to be that thing, right? The armies of heaven are praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven... The shepherds said to each other, I wonder how long it took them to talk. (laughs) Just for a second, right? Just like, think about that. How long do you think it took them? Who was the first one to say something? It's like this holy moment, you don't want to ruin it. You don't want to mess it up with our like little, little ideas about what just happened. And I love this. The shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. 
So this is what they did. They hurried. They ran. They went with everything they could to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. Look at the cadence of their life. What might have been like stuck and stale and stalled out in fears and insecurities, anxieties, all that just melted, and now they're in this focused race to get to where the promise was being fulfilled. All that that seemed to maybe kind of hinder them up to this point, anything that they might have been insecure about, all seemed to evaporate because of their encounter in the presence of God. And now something has shifted inside of their hearts because of this moment in God's presence, and they run to the place where Jesus is. Hey, there's a Savior of the world. He's here. Let's go. Let's not, let's not think about it. Let's not go to a class about it. Let's not debate about it. Let's not sit and strategize about it. Let's go. And I love this. When after seeing Jesus, the shepherds told, they told them only the people they knew would listen what had happened. No, that's not what it says, is it? Some of you are like, Richie. The shepherds, they told who? Everyone, what had happened. And what the angel had said to them about this child. Listen, all, everybody who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. And how is it that these guys who are on the outside of society have gone from probably a little insecure about the role that they were being given to boldly proclaiming everything that they just heard? And not to the select few that they knew might listen to them, might come with them to church if they were to invite them, right? Like, not to just the, like, everyone was on the list. Because of what we've just encountered, we can't help but tell everybody we know about what happened, about what God has done, about what just happened in our midst, about what's, what's going on in our world. We, we got to go. We got to tell everybody. And here's what I just kind of sink into as I look at this passage is that God's presence is everything. And if there's one thing that you got today, it's this. God's presence is everything for us as a church. If you're writing stuff down, this is it. Like God's presence, it's everything. Like, like what are we seeking? What are we doing here today on a Sunday morning? What are, we, what are we hoping to accomplish? Why are we in these seats? Why are we having this conversation? Because the presence of God changes us, changes everything, changes circumstances, changes pain, changes brokenness. The presence of God is everything for us as a people. Without the presence of God, we would not be having this conversation. Without God's presence in our lives, we would have no focus, no aim, no hope, no peace, none of it that we're looking for. The presence of God is everything for us. And man, man, I think about this conversation and how easy it would be to strategize about it, philosophize about it, try to figure it out. But there's just a simplicity, isn't there? Oh, God's presence. I got to get into his presence. If the Savior of the world is here, I got to see him. And if I'm encountering what I really think I'm encountering right now, this is not a dream. This is not made up. These are really angels singing right here. This is the glory of God surrounding me right now. Then, then I got to go. I got to go. I got to obey. I got to do whatever they tell me to do. I got I to gotta make sure that my heart is, is in tune, in sync, 100% committed to whatever is, is being shown to me, whatever God is asking me to do. I love what the presence of God does in our lives. It seems to declutter things, doesn't it? Like all the priorities we used to have don't matter anymore. All the things that we used to be worried about, all the people that we were anxious about, all the people we were hoping to please really seem kind of insignificant now. All, all the, the stress that we've been so focused on, all the problems we've been so trying to solve, all the questions we've been trying to answer, all, all, all the things that we've been trying to make sure are in line for our lives don't seem to matter anymore. God's presence is everything. I want you to think about what God was doing by sending his son here to earth. He was bringing his presence to us. Think about these shepherds. They weren't asking for God's presence to show up in their lives. They're out in the fields watching their sheep doing what shepherds do. But don't you love how God in his love and his grace interrupts our, our, our kind of meager little existence with his presence? 
Aren't you so grateful? For those of you that have experienced the power and the presence of God, aren't you so thankful that God doesn't leave us to ourselves, but comes into the middle of our mess and our brokenness and in the middle of real life and shows up and says, hey, I want to do something miraculous in your life. I am not content to leave you trying to achieve your life and your success and your purpose. I want to call you to something greater. Aren't you grateful that God doesn't leave us where we start? Aren't you grateful that God is so committed to bringing his people into right relationship with him? See, see, up to this point in human history, when, when we're seeing this story in, uh, in, engaged here, we, all of mankind was trying to get in the presence of God. The, the Jewish people were given kind of a playbook for how to do that. It was a sacrificial system. They would sacrifice animals. And then a priest would go in one time a year into this place called the Holy of Holies where God's presence actually dwelt. Think about it. One guy who was ordained by, by being in this, born in this special family got to go in one time a year. Think about how limited God's presence was in those days. How hard to access it was. In fact, if you weren't in that family and you didn't have the right kind of uh, genes and all the right stuff, you were out. God sat at a distance. And then, and then even prior to this, 400 years of silence preceded this moment right here. Where people had never known God's voice, known God's presence, known God's, God's movement and work in their lives. 400 years, generations have gone by that have not known the work of God. Silence. And, and so, so, so when you think about the specialness of this moment, God is going, hey, I'm going to make it possible for all people to walk into my presence. Not just one priest, one time a year. Everyone. Amen. I'm going to send my son to earth. Why his son? Because the standard for being in God's presence is perfection. Like, he is holy. So, so to be in his presence, you got to be holy. Otherwise, it's like the sun. You'll just burn up. I mean, literally, those priests that would go in one time a year into the Holy of Holies, they'd tie a rope around their waist and, and drag them out if the bell on the edge of their, their robes ever stopped ringing. They know that they fell over dead in the presence of God. They couldn't exist in the presence of the Holy God. Think of the fear. Yet now here the Son of God, God himself, is coming to earth to say, hey, you can't make yourself perfect, holy, the way I have designed you to be. You rebelled. You walked away. You did your own thing. You had your own agenda. You wanted to run your own life, and look what it got you. But I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to save you. I'm here, I'm here to bring my presence to you and make it possible for you to walk into the presence of God. Because of Jesus on earth who walked sinless and perfect, you and I had an opportunity to be made right with God. The moment you and I repent of our self-led lives, receive Jesus as our Savior, we now have the opportunity to walk boldly into the presence of God. Like when we come into this room today, we don't come in with shame and fear and trepidation. If we have Jesus as leader of our hearts and our lives, we come in with an excitement and anticipation that the God of the universe wants to meet his people here and speak to us, right? We don't come in trying to caffeinate ourselves to get in these doors. We come in with an anticipation, right? Like God wants to meet me here. He wants to speak to me. He wants to make me his church that's going to be sent all over the city to make an impact in this world. Like, like something special is going to happen in this place today because God sent us his presence. Amen. And Hebrews 4, the author does such a good job capturing this. We'll throw it on the screen for you. Hebrews 4, 14 says, Since then, we have a great high priest, he's speaking of Jesus, who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. I love this language. What did the shepherds have to talk about when they told everyone? They only had what they had encountered to talk about. The writer of Hebrews is going, hey, let's hold on to what we've seen, to what we've experienced, to what we've known of the love and the grace and the presence of God. Let us hold on tightly to the grace of God that's been poured out in our lives. Like the moment that you knew you were forgiven, the moment that you knew God loved you no matter where you've been, what you've done, where you thought you had been, God was saying, no, I love you. I'm going to reveal myself to you, draw you into myself. Let's hold fast, he says, onto this confession. Let's hold fast onto the testimony of what God is doing in our lives. Like the thing that we have 
The thing that the shepherds had was the encounter with God. Like you've got nothing special inside you. You and I have the power and the presence of God in us and working through us because of what he's done in us. It's not us doing it. It's God himself. So think about this. What would have made the shepherd's story credible? Because they're the most probably uncredible, incredible, whatever the right word is, people that society would have listened to. If it would have been a king, oh yeah, listen to that guy. If it would have been a person of authority, oh yeah, listen to that person. But there was no authority from a societal or cultural kind of norm with these shepherds. What, what made the, the, the confession that they held on to legitimate that all who heard, right? All that hurt were overwhelmed, were, were, were astonished by their words. What would have made it credible? I really believe the credibility comes from the conviction of what they saw and experienced. You, you've, you've talked to people that don't really know what they're talking about, right? You've been sold that thing before. And when people tippy-toe through a conversation, like, I think God's awesome, kind of, sometimes, I, I've heard. God, God can change people's lives. I've, 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 I've gone to a church where that kind of thing has happened before. Man, if you don't got a story, a confession of what God is changing inside of you as you're encountering his presence, man, I, I think you and I got some work to do to get into the presence of God. Amen. And it's not a statement of condemnation. It's a statement of invitation that says, no, hey, if I'm not being changed, then I got to get in the presence of God because I'm trying to change myself and it's not working. I got nothing to talk about, right? He says, hold tightly. Sorry, I sidetracked off of Hebrews 4. Hold tightly this, this confession that we've got. You okay with sidetracks sometimes? Amen. Okay. For, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. I love this about Jesus. He's not like sitting in some disconnected theoretical place. But God sent him here and in the mess of this life. As a baby, one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet he remained without sin. Let us then with confidence rely. I love this. God's presence is everything. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. God's presence is everything. And I think about how easy fears cloud our judgment. Well, God wouldn't receive me because of all this mess up I did this week. God, God wouldn't love me. God wouldn't use me. God wouldn't choose me. God, God can't. These people won't. And I'd love to invite people to, to be a part of Christmas Eve, but they won't. And God can't. And we shouldn't. And I won't. How easy fear clouds our judgment. What we don't need, we don't need like more answers and more classes and more kind of like figure out strategy sessions. What we need is more of God's presence. Amen. Because in his presence, we're changed. We have stories to tell. We have things to share. We have hope inside our heart. We have an anticipation of what God might do in somebody else's life. Man, I think about some of the people that we've been praying for. Some of you have been praying for years for somebody to come to know Jesus. And the hopelessness that sometimes we feel in those moments of prayer is like, God, if there's any way, can you strangle them, do something, God, right? Like something like, ugh. And even in that place of hopelessness, I love that when we're in the presence of God, he reminds us of what he's doing in our lives, what he's capable of because of how he's shown himself to us. Like, like our hearts fill with this faith that says, you know what, God, the work that you're doing in me, you could do in somebody else. The work that you're, you're revealing in my life is something that you want for everybody in this city. God, this is not just for a select few sitting in a certain room on a certain day. God, no, this is for the entire world. Your presence, your kingdom, your love, your grace, God. This is something we're going to hold on to, this confession of your work in our lives. Because, because, God, this world needs to know that your presence changes everything. This world needs to know, God, how good it is to be in your presence. God's presence is everything for us for life. If there's anything, here's the invitation. If there is anything today... 
that is keeping you from God's presence, if there is anything that is keeping you from running wholeheartedly to the feet of, of, the, of Jesus, the Savior of the world, if there is anything that is hindering you, any fears, any anxieties, any cares of this world, the invitation is to shrug it off. To, to get rid of those things and overwhelm yourself with a, with a desire for the presence of God. Here's how you don't shrug it off, by focusing on it. Oh, I got to get better at that, Richie. I'm hearing you. I got I to gotta quit doing that. I got to quit drinking that way. I got to quit hanging out with those people. I got to quit. I got to quit. I got to stop focusing on it. Amen. Our hearts are consumed with the presence of God. And when our attention and our affection is like the shepherds to run to see the work of God in people's lives, to run to see the presence of God, to run to get face to face with the creator of the universe, all that other stuff just, it just falls away. It all is so small in comparison to the greatness and the glory of the God of the universe. And that's just who I believe God wants us to be as a people. Not of people who've got it all figured out and strategizing enough and are smart enough and got it all planned out, but people that are passionate about the presence of God. Amen. People that are passionate about encountering the God of the universe, of seeing him face to face, of knowing his voice, yeah. not being content with the voices of this world, but saying, God, your voice is the voice that I want to direct this life. Yeah. Your heart, God, your purposes, your passion, God, these are the things that are going to rule this heart. And so here I come on a Sunday morning, God. Here I come to my connect group. Here I come to these moments when your people are together. Here's what's so special about the people of God coming together is the presence of God is so powerful. Sometimes you got no faith, but the person standing next to you has got tons of faith. Thank God for church, right? Man, you barely crawled in here today, but there's some people that skipped in here today. You hate them, but you're excited that they're here, aren't you? Because they got faith that you don't have and you need the, the, the passion of this room to lift your heart out of the mire of this last week. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Sometimes when we gather, we don't even, we're not here for ourselves. You're here for the person that's sitting behind you. You know, you're worshiping with your hands in the air and you have no idea the confession, the testimony that that is to the person standing behind you. That's not why we worship. We're just focused on, with passion on the presence of God. But the testimony of what God's doing in our lives and, and the joy that we bring into these moments starts to set an atmosphere in this room that says, God, your presence is so everything to us. We're not going to be overwhelmed this Christmas season with all the craziness of life. God, we are focused on you. We want to be in your presence. We want to know your glory. We want to see your face. We want to hear your voice, God. We seek your presence. God, the Spirit is here and wants to speak to you. He wants to encourage you. He wants to heal you. He wants to transform you. He wants to break bondage in your heart. He wants to release you from fears and captivity of anxiety. He, he wants to set you completely free. Some of you have not believed freedom was possible. But the Spirit of God is here to set you free. I just want to give you a moment right now just to seek His presence. He's here. He's ready. Arms are open wide, ready to reveal Himself to you. He might show you some stuff that's holding you back. But just for a moment, go, God, I, I want your presence. Maybe you're a young person in the room and you've never known his presence. All you've known is kind of church motions or things that you should be doing and shouldn't be doing. Just for a moment, don't focus on any of that. Just focus on Jesus. Let him speak. we seek you. We seek your presence. We seek your face. We don't seek you for what you can do for us. We seek you for who you are. Your glory captivates our heart. 
your goodness overwhelms our souls. Your power shrinks all of our problems. God, your peace guards our hearts and our minds. Lord, your presence is stronger than any lies that the enemy might be whispering in any heart and mind in this place. We resist the devil. He has no place here. God, this is your people called by your name for your purposes, God. These are a people, God, that may be unlikely, but called. Maybe unqualified, but submitted and ready to be used by you. God, this is a people, Lord, that that have said, yes, we will seek your presence. We will seek your purpose. We will seek your glory, God. We are not content with the ways of this world, the things of this life, the anxieties that this world is constantly bombarding us, God. We, we, we want your presence, God. We want your power, your glory, your authority in every one of our hearts and lives, God. We just confess today, Jesus, that we need you. We desire you. We long for you. We hunger for you. We, we look to you, God, above everything else, Lord. Thank you for your power and your presence. Thank you, God, that you consume every fear, every anxiety, every worry that might cloud our hearts or our judgment. God, thank you that your presence melts all that away, God. We are your people seeking your presence, God. Real life, would you stand to your feet with me this morning? Man, I think about this season that we're heading into. There's, there's going to be room through this month, whether it's our Anything and Everything series or our Christmas Eve Eve service, Christmas Eve services. There's room in this place for thousands of our friends and family to encounter the presence of God. Here's what I'm hoping is that we walk out of here today with a story to tell of God's power and his presence in our lives. Not with a great strategy, but a story of what God is doing in your heart right now. Man, some of you, you need to take that first step and surrender your heart to Jesus. For you to be in right relationship with God starts with a place of surrender. Your perfection won't get you right with God, but Jesus' perfection will. And he's here to offer you his perfection today. Through submission and obedience, you can walk into that perfection. That's what baptism is all about. That's why we celebrate it like crazy around here. It's kind of a weird picture when you think about it. People going down into the water in front of a bunch of people, right? But the power of the picture is so amazing that that's like a grape. And all your old life, all your old sin and shame and guilt and condemnation, it goes down into that grave like Jesus went into the grave. When he was willing to take your sin on himself for you. But then you come up out of the water like Jesus came up out of the grave, a completely new creation, ready to walk toward the purpose of God for your life. Man, I, we as a church, as a family, want you free to become who God made you to be. Not bound up by all the old stuff, free to become who God made you to be. If you need to be baptized, our team is in the back today. We've got shirts, shorts, towels, everything you need to take that step today. Head back there as we start to sing. Some of you group leaders, elders, uh, pastors in the room, would you come forward so we can pray for people this morning? Some of us, we need to seek the presence of God and, and we need to do it with some people of faith. These people standing up here are people of faith that would love to have faith where you feel like maybe you don't have some faith. Let's worship together. This is a new song the team's been writing. I'm so proud of our team. Let's worship together as we pursue the presence of God. Come on, let's worship.